Becoming a serious YouTuber is usually not a process that tends to happen overnight, at least not in the circles I run in. I know there's people out there who go out and spend like five or $8,000 to just get set up with, you know, pro-grade everything. But most channels like mine, I think, start out with a potato camera and no particular plans. And over time, we upgrade to better cameras and uh, better sets and more forethought and less uh, uh, ums and uh, ahs and so on. There are a lot of paths you can take from a total beginner to a professional, and I'm certainly not at the end of that trajectory. Uh, the machine sitting in front of me here, though, is one step on that path. Um, but to explain why I built this and what it's all about, I'd like to tell you how I got where I am at all. And this will be a lengthy explanation. Uh, I don't know how long this video will be because uh, it's kind of intended for people who might be interested in doing this themselves or just interested in, in my channel itself. So I'm just gonna cover everything rather than you know leaving stuff out that might be crucial or making like four separate videos that people will get sick of seeing on their feed so we're just going to go all the way through it the process of getting where i am was certainly all about baby steps at first i started out very small added things a little bit at a time you know 100 bucks here and there incremental improvements and then suddenly i found myself needing a four thousand dollar pc um expensive lenses a whole studio and now, apparently, an entire server dedicated to this task. So what happened? Um, my process of incremental upgrades went from baby steps to moon jumps, and it all started about two years ago when I bought a much better camera. But I didn't realize how much I'd bitten off. Now, mind you, that was my third much better camera, but it was also the first time that it was actually true. Let me explain. My very first YouTube video was shot on a Nexus 6P, which I clamped to the back of a chair. I pressed record, I did my thing, and I edited the footage with CyberLink PowerDirector right there on the phone and uploaded it. I shot a couple more videos like that just to make sure I actually wanted to do this for real. And by that time, I was ready to move on from a phone. I wasn't as much of a camera buff as I am now, but I still knew that Shooting on a phone was a waste of my time and I needed a real device. So I picked up a Sony Handycam off of Craigslist or something that ostensibly did 1080p, which I figured was good enough, right? Uh, well, that began a long, miserable process of learning how different video from two different cameras can look, even when they use the same resolution, frame rate, codec, and even bit rate. Uh, this camera is so bad that I immediately wanted it gone as soon as I got it. Um, besides the abysmal video quality it turned out to have, uh, this has many other awful qualities. Uh, for instance, the battery, no. Oh my God, the battery's removable. <laughs> In all these years. It's been like five years. I never noticed there's a battery door. <laughs> oh, I'm a doofus. I'm such a doofus. I was certain you couldn't remove it. In fact, I think there's room to put a second battery in it. If I had known this, I might have kept using it for a while. I am not a smart man. <laughs> anyway, I thought the battery was unremovable. So when it was out of power, I just had to plug it into charge. And there's no external power input other than um, a one inch USB cable. So you had to plug it in for like an hour and a half before you could use it again. Uh, this is pathetic. Also, um, the SD card is the micro SD variant, which it, it works fine, um, but it doesn't really feel very grown up. And if I can admit to having an ego, I didn't love how fiddly it was. It also does have an HDMI port, but it's this little dinky thing. I couldn't find a cable for it, so I couldn't hook it up to a preview monitor. And if you can't see what you're doing, it's really a problem if you're doing serious video, which is what I hoped to do. So very quickly, I replaced this with the cheapest camera on the market that had an HDMI output, which was the Canon Vixia uh, HF R800. This has marginally better video quality. Uh, it takes full-size SD cards, and it has a removable battery and an external power supply, so you can run it indefinitely. Those things made it far better than the Sony. At least I thought so. Anyway, uh, and this carried me through, I, I think, like a year of videos, although I still hated it the entire time. 
It does have HDMI, but it's the mini version, and anyone who's used those knows that they're fragile. They will bend and eventually break, usually in the middle of a shoot, uh, just under the weight of any cable anyone makes. Uh, maybe there's a fantasy world where you can get a cable that's light enough to not do this, but I've never seen one. Also, there's virtually no controls. It's all through a touchscreen. And I won't turn this video into a two hour hate fest for touchscreens, but I'll leave it at this. You deserve better. So after another year or so on this guy, I had some budget for equipment for the first time, so I invested in a much more professional piece of equipment, the Panasonic AG-AC30. It sure looks more impressive, doesn't it? There's a whole lot of um, things uh, going on here, far more uh, than these, these little uh, dinky soccer cameras. Uh, and in fact, I suspect to date uh, that I've actually shot more footage on this than any other camera I've owned. Although that does not mean that I don't hate it to death. I bought this camera because, yeah, it has a whole bunch of physical controls. It's got a proper grip, uh, the zoom control, uh, it's got uh, all these up here and all these buttons on the side, and these are important for professional videographers. You need immediate access to all the functions to get your job done, not a bunch of silly touchscreen shenanigans where you have to dig down through three levels of menus just to get to the white balance. Um, this camera has a white balance button right here on the side. So I thought, cool, direct access. Uh, plus these, these rings here give you direct access to zoom, uh, aperture, and focus, which all sounded fantastic. And it has support for remote control for all those things, uh, focus, aperture, zoom, and to start and stop recording. This looked like the cure for all my woes, and it even had full-size HDMI on the back that won't break off over time. Back then, I was shooting all my videos entirely on my own, so I needed to see what I was doing, so the HDMI was critical, and moving the camera around was a huge pain. I had to get out from behind my, my table to do it. So being able to remotely zoom in and out felt like it would make it a lot easier to shoot, and it kind of did. I used that a bunch. The biggest problem with this camera, though, is that the visual quality is, again, just horrible. I was never able to get anything out of this camera that looked natural. Like, it has bizarre color rendering that makes blue look purple, no matter how I massaged it. Uh, the video has weird sharpening that you can't really disable, um, which I suspect is due to the sensor being so crappy that the camera has to apply a ton of processing to try to make it look reasonable. Uh, the result is it looks blurry, over sharpened, and very noisy all at once, no matter what I did or how much light I blasted myself with to try to get the gain down. Uh, the controls are also incredibly awkward. They looked great, but it turns out that if you press that white balance button, it doesn't actually jump right to the white balance. It just toggles auto on and off. And when it's off, you then have to use this little guy here to cycle through white balance options on the screen, this little dinky thing that's really hard to read when you're shooting. It's actually worse than a touch screen. I also paid $1,200 more for this than that. And I would almost say that the videos are worse. In fact, the reason I shot so many hours of footage on this camera is not because it's great, uh, but because I never stopped rolling once I started. And that's a really weird way to operate, but I didn't have any choice. I was recording separates at the time, meaning my mic was plugged into a dedicated audio recorder, this Tascam here. Uh, and I had to do that because although this guy has balanced XLR inputs, which I thought made it far more professional than what I was using before, uh, they're terrible. The preamps are just horrible and the audio is unusably bad, so I had to record it on something decent. But recording separates meant that to start shooting, I had to hit go on this guy and go on the camera one at a time and then clap so I could sync the video and audio during editing. Well, I found out that uh, if I ever stopped the recording, I would never remember to turn them both back on. I would just do one or the other and then I would forget to clap to resync. Uh, and I lost several shoots to this problem. So I just had to keep rolling continuously the whole time, six, eight hours, even if I was moving boxes around the room or eating, because if I stopped, I knew I wouldn't remember to start again. So I ended up with gobs of useless footage just because my camera sucked. But as bad as that was, it didn't really harm me all that much because the files this camera outputs are not very big. The maximum quality mode of this camera is only 25 megabits. That's actually the uh, same as the $200 Canon here and only marginally better than the Sony, which I think is like 12. Uh, it's also identical to a DV camcorder from 1997. 
it's H.264 instead of DV, so it's not quite comparable, but it's still a painfully low bitrate, especially for 60 FPS HD. Uh, there's an advantage to it, however. At 25 megabits, you can record an awful lot of footage without really thinking about it. It's only about three megabytes per second or 187 megabytes per minute, uh, or about 10 gigabytes per hour, meaning a 128 gig SD card could get nearly 13 hours of recording. And since the Panasonic has two SD card slots, I could put a 128 in both of them and roll for a whole day if I had to. Since these files were so small, my standard workflow was to pull the cards from the camera, put them into my computer, and just copy all the files off like any normal human being. So managing my video files was not hard. But of course, the Panasonic was, after all, terrible. I hated its guts, and I still do. Um, I didn't learn until a year after I bought this thing that it's basically uh, one of those house of worship cameras that all the manufacturers make. Uh, they're sold in kits of like three or four to churches. Uh, and to put it mildly, these prioritize live shooting features and low cost over quality. I really let myself get got on this thing, and I only keep it around because I wouldn't want to sell it and thus inflict it on someone else. Still, it's kind of this picture of Dorian Gray that sits in the corner and gets uglier every time I look at it, and reflects the ugliness of my own soul. So when I had the money and I learned a little bit more, I made my first proper upgrade to a camera that I knew wasn't a complete clown show. That was the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 6K, uh, which I will someday do a video about. Uh, but for now, here's a JPEG because, you know, it's the thing I'm shooting this on, so I can't really show it to you. The Blackmagic actually fails the direct controls for everything test that made me want the Panasonic. If you didn't know better, you'd think it looks way less functional. Uh, in fact, almost everything is done through a touch screen. It doesn't have all these buttons and knobs. But it's a much bigger and better designed screen than the Canon had. In general, this camera turned out to be so much better in every imaginable way that I just haven't really cared. Despite having a touch screen, it is far easier to use than the Panasonic. Plus, now that my girlfriend has volunteered to operate the camera for all my shoots, I don't need remote control anymore. She takes care of everything. I could come up with complaints about the Pocket Cinema 6K if I really wanted to, but I don't. I love it. It does what I want, I can rely on it, and it only costs a little more than the Panasonic, which, let me tell you, still really stings. Most importantly though, the quality of the video itself is so stunning that I am regularly in awe of the results. I sometimes look up during editing and I see a freeze frame that looks like a still photo from a real camera, and I'm astonished that this is how video works now. I remember in about 1999, I was reading a prediction on the website photo.net, I think from the owner, Philip Greenspan, that in 20 years, nobody would own still cameras anymore. We just have high-speed camcorders and we pick out interesting stills. That's kind of what's happened if you wanted to do photography that way. Like, you could. You could get a Blackmagic or another, you know, prosumer cinema camera, set it to a high shutter angle and just point it at things, and later you'd be able to pick out some beautiful images. It's like I'm taking a high resolution DSLR still photo 60 times a second. It's incredible. But of course, there's a price for that performance, and it's all about storage. As I've said many times before, video is the great space filler. You're hard pressed to come up with anything that can fill up a hard drive quite that fast. There's a lot of you that have probably chewed through terabytes of storage with your extremely legal movie and television collections on your Plex servers. But the people who produce all that video are on a whole other level. We look at an 18 terabyte hard drive and go, oh, is that all? That's a knife. To give you an idea, here's a folder that contains all my finished projects since I got this camera. Uh, that is to say, the actual rendered out files that I upload to YouTube. It's about one terabyte all on its own, and this folder contains all of the raw footage for all those, in case I ever need to re-render or uh, reuse footage from an earlier project, and that's about 1.7 terabytes. It doesn't sound like that much, but it's also only like a dozen or so projects, uh, and it's chewing up about three tibs. That's, that's how I say terabytes for short. That's not nothing, and if I was one of those like three video a week YouTubers, or if I was shooting a lot more B-roll or multiple angles, this would be four or five times that size. Also, this is not the original footage. My final renders are limited to bit rates that fit YouTube's pathetic quality levels, so at most about 40 megabits per second, which is less than twice what my crappy Panasonic shoots at. 
All of my archive footage, on the other hand, has been recompressed with H.265, which has such great efficiency that it can store my 10-bit 4K 60fps footage with almost no perceptible loss in quality at only around 10 megabits per second. So this all sounds pretty reasonable. Um, eight terabyte hard drives are under $200 now, so what exactly am I whining about here? Well, unfortunately, those bit rates are only practical for archival purposes. The camera I'm actually shooting with does not record at those comfortable, quaint bit rates. It goes a little bit harder. Here's a clip from the video you're watching right now. Isn't post-processing magical? This dialog shows all the details of the encoding. I shoot at 4K, 60fps, with Apple's ProRes 422HQ codec, and the highlighted number there is the bit rate. Now, this is not a bug in my media player. It's not supposed to say kilobits. This footage is playing back at 1100 megabits. That is a little over a gigabit per second. I don't exactly know why it's this high. Blackmagic themselves say it should only be about 940 megabits. So where the extra 200 comes from, I don't know. But I've done the math and the file sizes confirm it. This is a tremendous amount of data. It's being pushed at a really staggering speed as well. Uh, to give you an idea, if you were to plug my camera into a gigabit ethernet cable and ask it to push its video across the network, it would instantly saturate the connection, zero to 100. I've tried playing a raw clip over my LAN and it can't keep up. The video just stutters, you can't watch it. Uh, to put too fine a point on this, 1100 megabits is about 138 megabytes per second, or about eight gigabytes per minute for the Europeans out there. That means that if you press the record button on this camera by accident, by the time you realize your mistake and hit it again, you'll have recorded at least half a gig of footage. It is a mind boggling amount of data. At this rate, you can fill a terabyte in two hours. And that presents some really interesting problems because this is an objectively high-end speed bracket still for consumer storage. And also because video shoots often run for far more than two hours. I've been here for eight hours before rolling tape for nearly the entire time. That comes out to four terabytes of footage. Where the hell do you put all that? Well, it turns out that's kind of an unsolved problem. If you didn't know better, you would think that a memory card format would have popped up to solve for this. But as far as I can tell, that didn't really happen, um, at least not in the consumer or prosumer market because they don't really need it. As actual pro cameras went HD and pros began expecting solid state media in the mid 2000s, products did appear. Um, examples are the Panasonic P2, which I covered in a video a couple years ago, uh, basically an incredibly expensive SD card, uh, and also Sony's SXS a few years later, uh, but the cameras that these were made for were intended for television, news, that sort of thing. They usually shot at maybe 50 megabits because they were just gonna broadcast over ATSC in the end, and that's only about 20 megabits. Uh, the cards were also fantastically expensive. A 32 gig SXS cost something like $800 in 2009, and they also never made them much bigger than 128 gigs, and they weren't really fast enough for modern video, but they were succeeded eventually, uh, for instance, with Sony's XQD and AXS cards, uh, which are certainly fast enough, but again, the slots for them, as far as I've seen, only ever show up in pro-grade equipment, and the cards are either far too small, ludicrously expensive, or both. Uh, XQD has the speed, but the size tops out at 256 gigs, uh, while AXS goes up to one terabyte, but costs a cool $4,000. I don't know what other formats might exist. Um, I think Panasonic has had some stuff with similar prices and limitations, and I've never seen any of it show up in the sub-pro market, where I am. All this is just to give you an idea how much companies want to charge for the privilege of truly high quality video, but honestly, who can blame them? If you're a genuine consumer walking into Best Buy to get a camera, I don't think you can buy one that comes anywhere close to the kind of disc gobbling output that I'm talking about with this camera. And even those people who are shooting like 4K60 are probably doing it on a phone directly into a format like H.265. My Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 6K, as the name suggests, is sold as a cinema camera. It is supposed to have absolute maximum image quality. Likewise, Sony's AXS cards are sold as accessories for their Venice, another line of cinema cameras. These are products that are closer kin to RED and ARRI than they are to camcorders. And short of video, I don't know what else anyone would need speeds like this for. So there's virtually no market for cheap, large, extremely high-speed portable storage. 
To be fair, there are SD cards, SDXC to be specific, which can hit these write speeds, but they never come in sizes above 256 gigs as far as I can tell, so unless you're only interested in rolling for a half hour before switching cards, that's no good. Uh, to be fair, pros might do that, but I don't and can't. I need longer run times than that. It turns out I was out of date on this info. One terabyte SDXC cards with the necessary speeds do exist and Blackmagic certifies some for my camera. However, there don't seem to be any on the market larger than one terabyte and the maximum read speed only seems to be about a couple hundred megs per second. Uh, as I'll get to, neither of those really satisfactory for my use. Uh, and there's supposed to be an SDUC standard that would fix both of these problems, but it seems like vaporware, nothing like that exists, and my camera wouldn't support it anyway. So we now return to Dharma and Greg. And that leaves only one actual option. That would be CFast, the supposed successor to Compact Flash, which you've never seen or heard of. Neither has anybody else. You can, in fact, get a one-tib CFast card with an absurdly high write speed, and it'll cost you $700 almost four times the price of a Samsung 870 Evo with twice the capacity. I can only speculate on why these are so expensive, but my guess is that, again, there's just no market. I don't know what you would use one of these for other than filmmaking, for which it is assumed you have the money to afford it. Well, unfortunately, or fortunately, the Blackmagic cameras, among others, have brought film-grade video to a ton of people who don't have movie-style budgets, like myself, and spending that much on so little storage really stings. Uh, as a result, I have never heard of someone putting a CFast or SDXC card into one of these cameras. Instead, everyone I see is adorned with one of these. This is the Samsung T5, which hit the market in 2017, and it's essentially a uh, 840 Evo grade SATA SSD packed into a tiny aluminum can with a USB adapter built in. You can plug this into your PC over USB-C and probably play most modern AAA 3090 killers off of it because it can read and write at nearly 500 megabytes per second sustained. This is, uh, relatively speaking, a smoking hot piece of tech, although it is a few years old. Uh, despite being as fast as it is, it's priced similarly to comparable desktop drives at only about $200 for a two terabyte model, which absolutely crushes CFast in the value space. So you won't be surprised to learn that the T5 has become a de facto standard for videography. This, to a lot of people, is digital film, to the extent that Blackmagic themselves have certified them as approved media. The numbers just make sense. Now, obviously, there's no slot for this on the camera, so where the hell do you put it? Uh, well, the answer, as you can guess, sucks. Uh, you go to Amazon, and for about $30, you can get an aluminum frame that's custom-shaped to fit these specific drives. So you've got a little clamp to hold the cable in place and everything. Uh, you screw this to the top of your camera or to your rig, uh, and just slide the drive in, and away you go. So this works well? No, of course not. It sucks. So much ass. Uh, you've got a cable hanging out of your device that can get snagged. Uh, the clamp covers up controls on top of the camera. Um, I've had the plug fall out during shooting. This basically doesn't meet anyone's standards and you're still gonna do it because the difference in price is so vast that you'd be willing to kiss a cactus to save this much money. I don't really know what happens if Samsung stops making these, other than probably uh, the price on the used market skyrockets as people try to get more media to put in all the clamps they've bought. Samsung actually followed up the T5 a couple years later with the T7, which upgrades to NVMe internally, USB 3.2 externally, and can deliver over a gigabyte per second of read and nearly as much write. Uh, otherwise, they're identical, so they'll fit in the same brackets, and while there were apparently teething problems that required a firmware update from Blackmagic, you can now use these with the Pocket Cinemas as well. Hi, it's me again. After I shot this video, I bought a Samsung T7, and once it arrived, I found out that it doesn't fit most of the existing clamps, because it's 2022, so they had to make it thinner. This doesn't really help in any way. Uh, the dimensions are nearly the same. It's the same width and a little bit longer, which seems, again, totally unnecessary. Why they felt the need to make an already tiny drive 
even smaller when most likely the actual components inside are exactly the same size in both of them and knowing as they certainly do how these are being used by pros who actually need them to stay the same dimensions versus the public who couldn't care less what size they are they're just going to throw them in a bag is just beyond me it mostly feels like spite i think they did it to be mean now all the other benefits still remain it's still fast as hell uh, but this is still a tremendously rude a uh, completely unnecessary decision. So welcome to the future, where problems are guaranteed to never remain solved, no matter how much they look that way. Anyway, we now return you to Neon Genesis Evangelion. So this more or less solves the problem on the storage front. This is what you're gonna write your video to. But once you've shot all your video, what do you do once you get it back to the editing bay? That's this, by the way. This is the editing bay. The old workflow with my SD cards and 25 megabit clips was to copy it all over to my hard drive, and that's just good sense. You don't want to edit off your originals. What if you press delete on the wrong file or lightning strikes? You could lose everything. So you copy everything to your hard drive, then you pull the card out and stick it somewhere safe. But how do you do that with two terabytes of footage? If I shoot for four hours, which is not uncommon, I'm gonna fill up one of these drives. And if I wanna copy that off to my PC, I'm gonna need an entire two terabyte SSD that's completely empty at all times. I can't use it for anything else. It would just have to sit there completely useless year round, except when I'm working on a video. And what's so wrong with that? Well, simply put, I don't have that kind of discipline. If I'm doing something on my PC and I need some disk space and I can't find it anywhere else, I'm not gonna be sensible. I'm gonna dump that data on my editing SSD and tell myself I'll clean it up later. And I won't do that. And when I need to unload one of these, I will not have the room to do it. This would totally trash my workflow. And besides, it wouldn't be one SSD because I sometimes fill up multiple. I actually own three of these T5s, tape A, tape B, Tape C's in the camera right now. Usually I fill up at least one of them per shoot, uh, and then about a quarter of another one for B-roll. Uh, but on really complex videos like the one I did about the X300 multi-user uh, PC, I've even filled up all three. That's six terabytes of video. And that would require me to have $600 of SSDs sitting in my PC year round that I can't use for any other purpose. I, I hate that. <laughs> You can probably see why I convert all my files to H.265 for archiving. I can't possibly store them long term at these sizes. A single video shoot would basically consume one half to an entire hard drive forever. So H.265 is necessary for archival, but editing it is completely untenable. So I can't just convert everything to that format when I get home because the codec just isn't designed for that purpose. Um, if you load that into your video editor, every time you drag the playhead around, it's gonna freeze for like 10 to 30 seconds. And it gets worse if you're stacking up multiple clips. It just doesn't work. Even worse than that, recompressing that footage happens less than twice real time, only about 100 frames per second at best. So it takes hours to do it, even with the assistance of an RTX 3070 doing the encoding. But all of this is getting way ahead of ourselves because just copying the contents of one SSD to my PC alone will take an hour. And that's not really workable because when I get home from a shoot, I want to start editing right away. I'm never going to have the discipline to wait that long. And it'll be even longer if I filled up multiple drives. And there are more angles to this, most of which are just based on my idiosyncrasies. But you know, I'm the person who has to put up with me. I got to do what I need. I'm my manager. So this is a tough nut to crack for me. And in general, we're talking about a ton of data that needs to be read at a speed that is actually kind of challenging to consumer hardware. So this whole thing is hard to deal with. So how have I solved this up until now? Well, you know the answer to that already. I didn't. My process since I got this camera has been as follows. Uh, when I get home, I plug the SSDs into my PC with USB cables and just dangle them over the side of the case, uh, pretty much just like this, uh, and then start editing directly off the drives themselves. I actually improved the situation uh, only a couple months ago. I picked up this uh, Kingston dock. Um, I put a non-affiliate link in the description since they're kind of hard to look up if you don't know the model. It's not intended for this purpose at all. You're actually supposed to buy these weird little modules with like a USB port or a single card reader and uh, put them into these bays, to sort of build your own custom memory card reader thing. It's actually really silly as a product. I don't know who it's for, but somebody noticed that it fits these T5 drives really, really poorly. I mean, it's, it's, it's an awful fit. Uh, if you wiggle them, 
<laughs> They're pretty damn loose. So if you aren't careful, this is probably a great way uh, to destroy the plugs on your drives, but it's a damn sight better than just hanging them over the side of your case or having them on a desktop uh, just sort of laying there, which was what I was doing before. Uh, so now I can bring these home and just plug them in here and they're up on a shelf where they're safe. It's better than nothing, but it's still pretty pathetic and I'm still editing directly off the drives. Sometimes when I was editing off the drives plugged into the cables, one would actually come unplugged, which would crash DaVinci Resolve uh, with unsafe changes, and I'd have to plug the drive back in and redo all my work. That's how bad this was, okay? And of course, at any time, I could have gotten a virus, pressed delete in the wrong folder, or had one of these fail, and I would have just lost a whole shoot forever. In fact, this sort of happened a few weeks ago. I alluded to it in my last video, but I have an SSD in my desktop PC that I use for Scratch. That is, it's where I keep files that I need for current projects, but which aren't the primary footage for them. Things like um, ad clips, old videos that I'm referencing, static images, things like that. Uh, and it's also where I render out finished videos before I upload them, just sort of working space. Everything's in, in one place. Uh, well, in the middle of working on a video uh, about a month ago, my PC started freezing and I investigated and found I was getting errors from my hard drive controller, which pointed to the scratch drive. I proceeded to back up the whole thing and got a handful of CRC errors, uh, which told me the flash chips had in fact failed. This was hilariously the second time this had happened this year. My previous scratch drive failed six months ago. I had to RMA it with Samsung. The one that just died is the replacement they sent me. It didn't even make it half a year. When the first one died, I lost a couple finished renders that I can't easily recreate. And uh, the second time I lost one, um, I'll probably never get those back. I could re-render them, but I'm probably not going to. Um, so that sucks. But this is really all my fault, and it's just because I'm a dumb baby doofus who didn't bother backing anything up. It's not that I didn't have a system for it, I actually put quite a lot of effort into one. Um, several years ago, I built a NAS, uh, or Network Attached Storage, uh, basically just a big file server built around a machine with a bunch of hard drives in it. Very similar to the one I have here, in fact. Um, I actually suspect that my home NAS was built to compete with this one. It's also a 2U rack chassis, uh, but instead of a Dell, it's a less well-known brand, Quanta. In retrospect, I wish I'd gotten a Dell for that machine, but I digress. I set this up originally for the same reason everyone does, um, theft. Uh, so my girlfriend and I could centralize our collections of very legally acquired console games and tokusatsu television shows, just like everyone who has a home NAS. Plex is the only thing anyone ever does with a server at home. We just steal shit. Uh, I also had plans to do many other things with virtual machines and servers and whatnot, none of which panned out, so it's just a NAS. Now, the most important thing for network attached storage is that it have lots of storage, and uh, you can see from the picture that there are 12 yellow buttons on the front of that machine. Those are all hot swappable drive bays, much like this guy has. Each one of these slots up here can take a hard drive or an SSD. Now I stuffed my home NAS full of multi-terabyte hard drives to store all of our crap, uh, but I also included a pair of drives for backing up all of my work stuff, uh, my finished videos and whatnot. And I had been doing a pretty good job of using that backup until I just wasn't anymore. At the time that my last scratch drive failed, I had not bothered to back anything up in weeks or months, and I'm very lucky that I didn't lose more. I was able to copy almost all of it off. Um, I had the only copies of at least six rendered videos on there, among other things, so this really could have been a disaster. In the wake of this, I realized it was time to commit to a more serious, long-term solution. Um, this gig I'm doing here, for better or for worse, is half my income and something I don't want to stop doing for the foreseeable future. I take this very seriously, but the way I've been handling my data is anything but. I mean, editing straight from my negatives? Am I out of my mind? Not running regular backups? What the hell am I doing over here? Come on, get with the program. It's time to do something about all this. And there are a lot of approaches, um, but I went with one that fits my idiosyncrasies. Some people might have solved this problem by building a NAS and setting up scheduled backups uh, from their PC to the NAS. But I don't have the discipline for that either. Uh, see, I, I do many things on my PC. I play games and, and lots of stuff, and I have very poor sleep habits. So if I set up backups to run every day at midnight, 
Well, they're gonna start running while I'm still doing stuff and I'm gonna cancel them so it doesn't interfere with my wasting of time at one in the morning. I can set them to run at 3 a.m., but then they'll still be running when I come in in the morning and I'll cancel them then instead. So by the time something fails, I will discover that I have canceled the last two months worth of backups. Now, there are other concerns here, uh, increasingly nitpicky, honestly, but in short, I decided that I can't get myself to trust myself or any solution that involves my main PC. I know for sure that my discipline is not gonna improve. I need something that I know I can wrangle and something that isn't intimately connected to my personal computer. I need something independent and automatable. I'd also like to start putting my data on some mirror disks, particularly the scratch drive, uh, so that if one disk fails, even if the backups are working, you know, it just hasn't run yet, um, I won't instantly lose everything. Now you can mirror disks under Windows, but I have no idea if I can trust that. I've never known anyone who did it, and I'd expect it to make diagnostics even harder than they already are, and whether any of that's true doesn't matter. I don't have the time to learn any of it right now. I'd much rather just stick with what I have experience with, and that happens to be Linux and ZFS. Some people will probably disapprove of those choices for a multitude of reasons, but like I said, it's what I know, so it's what I'm using. Not up for debate, I've already built it, I'm not changing it, I'm just gonna explain what I'm doing and why. These reasons apply to me, maybe not you. Do better. This is the new server. I've named it VTR for videotape recorder because it's where the video lives. This isn't the new server, we'll talk about that later. This is a PowerEdge R720 XD, which a tremendous number of viewers will recognize because it's one of the most popular machines for home lab use in history. And it's quite a history too. This machine is from 2013. Despite its age, it's still very capable. It sports a pair of eight core Xeons, uh, which you can upgrade to slightly newer models that use about 30% power and have two extra cores a piece, which I will be doing at some point. Uh, it has a tremendous capacity for RAM. I got mine with only 32 gigs only, but you can push it to the absolutely absurd limit of 1.5 terabytes if you can find the right stuff. Uh, which isn't as unrealistic as it sounds uh, since thousands of these servers have been cycled out of businesses and you can often get DDR3 ECC for the price of water. There's also gobs of PCI Express connectivity, a total of 40 lanes of 3.0 spread across six slots internally. And of course the 12 bay disk array on the front uh, supports SATA 3 at a theoretical max of six gigabits of throughput. I don't know whether that's per drive or across the board, but I'm guessing it's closer to the former. Just about the only thing this doesn't have is USB 3, uh, but that's manageable. Uh, and putting its age aside, it is an extremely capable machine. I would like to pause for a moment though. Uh, before I go much further, I should mention that if this looks or sounds cool or fun, and you're thinking, I should get one of these, I don't think you should. <laughs> I'm completely disillusioned on the subject of servers. I used to think they were rad. Now I think they're super boring. I don't recommend you pursue this sort of thing for kicks. Owning and using these is a pain in the ass and you should do it only if you need to because they are miserable hunks of heavy steel that eat power and demand too much care and feeding. Um, this one, uh, for instance, is rack-based. You really don't want to own a rack server unless you have a rack. There's no way to make it a pleasant experience. Uh, server racks themselves are also very miserable to work with, not nearly as convenient as they look once they're all set up. Uh, they're meant to be assembled by a technician who's getting paid to do it and then ignored for years. And that's never going to happen in your apartment. You're going to need to dick with the thing from time to time. And it's a huge pain to get to a machine in a rack. I've owned at least four different racks and I've regretted every one. Now you can get basically identical hardware in a tower form factor, so you don't need the rack, but there's still big, heavy machines that would barely fit on this table. And uh, I also don't think they can offer the same drive capacities, so it's kind of even less worth it unless you're really convinced that whatever you're doing demands this grade of hardware. And of course, servers are loud as hell. Just about any server, at some point in its life, is going to make an enormous amount of noise. Uh, certainly when you first turn it on, and older ones, or high performance models, uh, might not ever stop screaming. I pop the lid off, because that interferes with the airflow and tells it to put the fans on max to compensate. Uh, but at some point, while you own one of these things, it's probably going to get this loud, and you won't be able to get it to stop being this loud. Uh, as you can hear, it is uh, intolerable, like being next to a jet engine starting up. But to be fair, these days, that is usually just when the machine is powering up. 
Servers made in the modern era are designed to save uh, money on cooling by managing fan speeds. So, with the lid on, it will turn the fans down to a far more manageable level. Bud, Bud, what are you doing? Bud, nothing's happening, calm down. <laughs> oh, there we go. In fact, uh, once this machine boots all the way up, uh, the fans will calm down quite a bit. And uh, there's a tower version that I almost bought instead uh, that was actually dead silent at idle. It would be comfortable to have in a bedroom if it came to it. But when you put a machine like this under load, it's gonna ramp those fans up and they produce a really unpleasant kind of howling noise that you don't wanna live with. Unless you have something like a basement where you can stick it in a corner where nobody will be able to hear it, these things are just annoying. Now I went with this machine because I do have a spot in the basement to stick it where the noise won't bother me. So this worked out. But uh, caveats aside, what are we actually doing with this machine? What does this get me? Well, uh, there's nothing really special about the system itself as far as the basic goal here is concerned. I could have used a five-year-old desktop PC. Servers do have some very neat management and hardware features, but for the stuff I'm doing, it's mostly just a big, loud computer. It'll run any standard operating system. Uh, in my case, I put Ubuntu Server 22 on it. It's not doing anything particularly unique. Um, I haven't installed any special hardware or software. It's just a bog standard server OS with a copy of Samba. That's the Linux program that lets you share files with Windows systems, because this will ultimately be pretty much a file server. Most of what will make this special uh, is just how I'm going to use its storage capacity. But there are a few features that running this on Linux is going to enable. I'll explain why this guy is here in a little bit. Uh, first, let's uh, take a look at what we actually have in this machine. The first two bays have these crucial BX500 SSDs uh, that a viewer got to help me out when my last scratch drive died. Uh, they're both two terabytes, and together, in a mirrored pair, they will be the new scratch disk. Uh, mirroring means that both drives have the exact same data. If one of them fails, and I haven't backed up, I'll have an opportunity to recover. The other drive should still be intact. In the next, two bays, I have a pair of Samsung 870 Evos. These are also two terabytes a piece, and I'm gonna store my raw footage on them so I won't be working directly off the originals. So basically, when I bring my footage home, I'm gonna plug these into my computer, copy all the contents onto these drives, and then the T5s will effectively become the backups. I'll unplug them, and then if something happens to these drives, or to my whole computer, um, I'll be able to recover all my footage off of them. The two Samsungs are just normal independent disks right now, no special RAID or anything. Uh, and there's two of them only because I need enough space to fit the majority of my shoots, which are four terabytes or less. Um, however, I'm probably going to stripe these together at some point in the future. And I'll get to why I'm doing that and why I picked gamer drives for this uh, in a bit. Now you may have noticed that I only have four tibs of storage in that pool, despite having six tibs of Samsung T5s. And that's just because SSDs are expensive, and in reality, I very rarely fill up more than two of them. I figured I'd try and get by with just two for now, uh, but since this machine has so many drive bays, I'm not using any of the bottom ones, uh, I'll have room to expand if I find myself doing six terabyte or larger shoots someday on the regular. Now in the next row here, I have spinning disks. So this is a pair of four terabyte Seagate Iron Wolves. And I won't bother pulling out both of these, but the other two are 14 terabyte uh, Seagate Exos. Uh, these are both set up as mirrored pairs. Now the larger ones, are set up for everything related to my channel. Um, archived video, you know, past projects, all that stuff, plus everything else for other personal projects I don't want to lose. Uh, the smaller pair is just for personal data, you know, my tax records and that sort of thing. Uh, when I was adding my backup drives to my old NAS, I realized I also needed to back up my personal stuff, uh, but I wanted to keep it all separate. If I ever need to like send all my business stuff off to cold storage, I won't need to carefully pick out my personal data. Now these spinning disks are just for long-term storage. You know, I'm gonna slowly back stuff up overnight and then if I ever need to use it, like you know, footage that I'm gonna use in a video, I'm gonna copy it off across the network onto an SSD. Um, these are never gonna need much bandwidth and in general, a NAS doesn't really demand a system anywhere near <laughs> this powerful. 
In fact, uh, prior to yesterday, these things lived in this awful little bastard. Uh, this is an HP Microserver Gen 7, uh, which came out in 2011, truly an ancient piece of crap. Uh, it's even older than the Dell. It was originally sold with Microsoft's small business server on it, and uh, if this is the sort of thing that they were selling it on, I'm not surprised that that product has been forgotten. As much as I wanted to love this machine when I first saw it, I mean, come on, look at it. It's just adorable. It's got, you know, a few ports on the back and it's just small, you know. Uh, unfortunately, it's pretty sad and terrible. Um, it suffers from a single AMD Turion 2 Neo N40L, a dual core 1.5 gigahertz laptop CPU, to which I can find no direct comparison, but I can assure you, having used it, it's a sad little baby loser chip that sucks. Um, I bought this machine from a friend for about $70, uh, only because on the front here, it has four hot swap hard drive bays. Uh, I really liked that, and then I discovered, once I got it, that it doesn't actually have any inside. There's a CD-ROM bay up here, but there's no place to put a hard drive. I had to buy adapter rails to put a boot disk in this thing. I think you're supposed to boot it off USB, but that sucks. This machine performs so much worse than I actually expected, like just for ordinary file server tasks. I mean, once I had everything migrated onto it, it did more or less okay. But when I was copying my data over to it, uh, I found out the CPU is so miserable that it can actually slow down file transfers, even at spinning disk rates. So I'd wanted to replace this thing for some time. And when I was building this new NAS, I figured why not uh, just do everything at once. So now, um, all my drives, for all purposes, live in this machine. Everything is central. Everything is in one place. And that means I can start talking about automation. For instance, um, I can now set up a nightly backup with like rsync that'll make sure that everything from the scratch disk gets copied to the archive disks in case I lose the entire mirror all at once. Um, that job will then email me the results nightly so in the morning I can inspect them and then weekly a separate job will compare the files in both places and alert me if they differ. So basically I'm going to have this machine narc on itself. Now these backups will be made to a folder that can be read but not written over the network. So if I catch a crypto locker or something it won't be able to reach across the network and trash all my archives. Uh, now, these disks are all running ZFS, a file system that's widely used for software-based RAID, and it offers a feature called scrubbing, uh, where disks can periodically be scanned and all the data compared to checksums to ensure that everything is actually intact. Now, this is critical because there's not really any other way to tell if a hard drive has failed. There's SMART, of course, which is supposed to tell you when a hard drive is near failure or has failed, but I last saw SMART actually work as intended in about 2004 and both my scratch SSDs were probably damaged for weeks before I noticed anything. Smart still doesn't say there's anything wrong, and nothing was wrong until I tried to access files that were in the dead zone. So this is the gold standard for verifying disks. You need to actually try to read the data to know if it's readable. Now, I don't know if there's any way to execute a scrub on a Windows PC. I don't think NTFS has the necessary brains for it. Uh, but even if it did, it's a resource intensive process. So again, I would end up canceling it pretty much every night. Uh, since the drives are in this machine, however, I can set up scrubs to run regularly and email me reports, as well as hourly status checks throughout the day that will also email me if any errors show up. And I've been doing exactly this on my existing NAS for about a year. I just threw together a script I, I put together in a couple hours, uh, and it's actually saved me from data loss twice when hard drives failed and I was able to find out, replace them, and rebuild the mirrors before anything else could go wrong. Now, these features alone are really all I needed. Backups, higher reliability, and a big chunk of storage for raw footage that's not located on drives that are physically in my PC. It's a dumb thing, but like I said, it's my idiosyncrasies, right? If they're network shares, I won't fill them up with weird crap like I would if they were in my system. Now, there's probably people watching who think that this is all fine and good, but I should have gone with TrueNAS or Unraid or something to get the much more robust and sophisticated features. Uh, and that's probably true for most people, but there's something you have to understand about me. I'm not very smart and I'm not very patient, so I'm not going to learn how to use those things correctly. So when they break, and they will break, they'll be way too complex for me to troubleshoot myself. Uh, so I have followed my own advice to never build a system that's smarter than I am. This computer is a big dumbass, and that means we see eye to eye. And altogether, I'd say this is a pretty good package, especially since I got this whole machine for just under $400, along with some accessories. 
Uh, they're commonly available online for less, like much, like $250, $275, um, but you do usually have to pay shipping or it has to be local for it to be worth it. Honestly, I could have done this with any old PC, a tower with eight drives in it or a laptop with some USB cables hanging out of it, but honestly, um, I hate cable management and I think that all hard drives should be hot swappable by law and that's really what's driving it for me. I just really don't want to deal with this many hard drives um, inside a, a PC or, or hanging out on top of a laptop or something. Um, but there are some other neat features of this device that fit my needs. See, one thing servers have that normal PCs never do is called lights out management. Uh, it's literally an entire independent computer with its own network interface and software that lives inside this machine to help you control and administrate it over the network. Um, let's look on the back here. See, on the back here, you've got your normal ports, you know, video, network, etc., that all go to the PC. But then over here, you've got this network jack. That goes to the LOM. Every server vendor has one of these. Um, Dell calls theirs iDRAC, and it offers a web interface that lets me do things like uh, see exactly how much wattage the system is using at any moment, as well as over time, um, which I actually really want so I can find out how much it's hurting my power bill. Uh, I can also look at temperatures and see, for instance, if a fan has gone bad or maybe the uh, coolers are clogged or something. Uh, and the reason this is called lights out management is because I can also turn the system on and off remotely, even if it's been shut down with the power button on the front or failed to power on after a breaker trip. As long as it has juice from the wall outlet, I can reach out and power this machine up. Um, I can also access the local console, um, the monitor, keyboard, and mouse input as if I was plugged right into the machine through a web browser, which is handy if it's suddenly stopped responding on the network and I need to do diagnostics. If the machine is completely wedged, you know, non-responsive, I can power cycle it. And then if it fails to boot, I can actually load a CD image push it over the network and boot the machine from like a Linux live disk to do offline diagnostics. If I had seen this kind of feature when I was 14 years old, I think I would have died from awesome. Every PC should have this. If you think I'm joking, you don't know me. In my socialist utopia, all PCs have LOMs by law. The coolest part is that since it's networked, I don't need to be at home to do this stuff. And look, maybe none of this is relevant or useful to you. If you can just, you know, walk over the machine, press the button, but I often find myself trying to access resources at home when I'm out. To me, this is an incredible lifeline. So this is pretty cool as is. Um, even if I dunked on servers earlier, I have to admit this is pretty neat. Uh, and the functions I've described so far are good enough. They, they're gonna solve my problems. But on a longer timeline, I have some greater ambitions. Uh, for instance, I would like an automated ingest workflow. The plan right now is that all these disks are just gonna be network shares. Uh, when I come home from a shoot, I'm gonna get my dock, and I'm gonna get my Samsung SSDs, just as I do today, plug them in, and then copy the data across the network onto this machine. I'm not gonna plug them into the server itself and copy the data locally. There's a few reasons for that. A really minor one is that the R720 is too old to have USB 3, so I'll have to pick up a card before I can even try it. Uh, and it also would be irritating to have to do it across the network because I'd have to probably SSH into this box and uh, copy everything from the command line or use WinSCP or something. But really, the big problem here is just that it would take a really long time. You know, like I said, it would take several hours in some cases to empty these out. Uh, during which I wouldn't have access to any of my footage. And like I said, that's kind of a killer for me. Uh, so I'm probably going to take these home, plug them into my PC, start editing right from them, uh, and then start the copy to the NAS before I go to bed for the night, if I can remember. Eventually, however, I'm hoping to change this when I upgrade from T5s to T7s. Those can read at twice the speed. So even though the camera doesn't need that extra speed, at a gigabyte per second, I could dump them to an SSD in this machine in about 35 minutes, less if I didn't fill up the entire drive. But of course, at that point, I'll actually exceed the performance of the 870 Evos that I picked up. Uh, they're pretty much matched in speed to the T5s because I hadn't thought about upgrading when I bought them. But it wouldn't matter if I had because even with faster drives, we're actually hitting the limits of the SATA interface. Even SATA 3, which this machine ostensibly has, maxes out at six gigabits per second, but the T7 can push data at eight gigabits. So faster SATA drives are impossible. I would have to go with NVMe on PCIe carriers, or like I mentioned earlier, 
I could stripe my Samsung Evos together. That will hopefully get their combined throughput up to 12 gigabits, enough to saturate a T7. And since they're just redundant copies that only exist for the duration of editing, the decreased reliability of striping won't matter. At these higher speeds, it actually starts to make sense to offload my footage before I start any editing. I'm always gonna have at least half an hour of downtime after I get home from a shoot. So if I get home, plug one of these in, start copying the files over, and then go have a beer or whatever, by the time I'm done, I'm gonna be ready to edit. And this would be ideal, but it brings up a new problem with me, uh, which is just that I'm a very disorganized person and I'm not gonna remember to start that copy. I'm, I'm gonna like wait an hour or so and then go, ah, shoot, I forgot to copy the data over. Now I'm right back in the same boat. So here's the ultimate goal. I'm going to stripe the 870s together, upgrade these to Samsung T7s, put a USB 3 interface in the server, and set up scripts to automatically ingest any new files whenever an SSD is connected. Uh, the scripts will prioritize the drives so that tape A, which I usually put my A roll on, will get copied before it tries to copy tape B and so on. So I can get home, pop the drives into the dock on top of the server, go about my business, and by the time I'm ready to work, my most important footage will probably be ready to use. And again, this might be something I could automate under Windows, but I don't really know where to start and it would inevitably get in my way. Um, I like to reboot my machine before I start editing to wipe out any system state left over from video games or whatever. And you can't copy files if you're rebooting. So it's another advantage of having a dedicated machine. So all that would be great. But finally, there's a wild fantasy that I don't think I'm gonna accomplish in the near future, but I can dream. And the dream goes like this. The part of my job that I am laziest about is converting my videos for storage. Um, like I said, I convert these into H.265 so I can store them long term. And pretty much as soon as I finish editing and publish a video, I'm supposed to go in and start that process of converting all the ProRes into H.265. I have a script that makes this easy, which I never remember to run. It often takes days and sometimes over a week for me to actually get around to doing this. Um, and the result is I've sometimes been unable to go do a scheduled shoot because I forgot to convert all my RAWs. So the disks are full. I can't copy the data off because I've got nowhere to put it. Um, converting it takes hours and hours. So I just have to either delete my last shoot, which is not acceptable to me, or wait another day so I can empty these out. Ugh. I don't want this to keep happening. But the only solution is to remember to start converting my files the night I bring them home, and that's an extremely resource-intensive process. So I can't start it unless I'm right about to go to bed, uh, and I always just seem to forget, and it's sometimes still going in the morning. If this workload could be moved to the new VTR system, set up an automated schedule, that would be fantastic, but that's not going to be practical, at least not in the near future, because this machine has no GPU. Uh, encoding video is possible with pure CPU power, but it is dog slow. Adding the dedicated silicon of NVIDIA's NVENC or whatever AMD might offer increases your performance by literally orders of magnitude. It turns a day long effort into six hours. It's so much faster that it just doesn't make any sense to try without it. It would be silly. Unfortunately, putting GPUs in servers, whatever Linus Sebastian has led you to believe, is often not as simple as it seems. The R720 in particular is a stickler. Some people have done it, but from what I've read, it doesn't seem straightforward. And the biggest problem is that servers of this type don't typically have six or eight pin power available inside. Servers rarely use ATX style power supplies. Instead, they use these modular supplies and everything is done with backplanes and board to board connections inside. With minor exceptions, there are basically zero cables inside this machine. Now I adore that and I think it should be the standard for all PCs unless you're really an enthusiast. Nothing should have cables in it. I won't debate this because I'm right, but it does mean that if you want to do anything that Dell didn't intend, eh, pretty much SOL. That's not to say they didn't intend this. Uh, there is a GPU riser available for the R720, not the XD, uh, that allows it to provide six pin power for GPUs. Um, but I think in 2013, that might've been as much juice as a GPU ever needed. Uh, it cannot do dual six pin or dual eight pin. And I also can't get a larger power supply to support that kind of thing. Okay, stop screaming. I got a few things wrong. Dell says that GPUs are not supported in the 720XD at all. I don't know why that would be from a hardware perspective, but I took their word for it. 
especially because I found very little info about it when I initially searched several times before writing this script, and it sounded, in the results I got, like the R720 was pretty sketchy about it as well. But I've now done some more specific searches, and I'm finding that people put 2070s and better in the R720 all the time, and other people saying that it will work in the XD as well. Dell just doesn't officially support it due to heat dissipation concerns. Supposedly, if you can manage the temperature, it's totally practical. Also, I thought I needed different risers, but you may have noticed when I showed the inside that the ones I have have suspiciously GPU-like six-pin power connectors. Seems that's probably what they are. I just missed it. Although it doesn't have eight pin outputs, supposedly you can get at least dual six pin if you use plugs from two cards. All I need is the appropriate cables. I was also kind of wrong about the power supply. Yes, you're limited to Dell specific models. You can't just slam any old gamer power supply in here, but if it's the wattage you're concerned about, there is an 1100 watt upgrade that slots right in and I can get one on eBay. So in reality, I could very likely put an RTX 69420 in here with no trouble, and eventually I probably will, although I'll explain why I'm not doing it right away in a moment. Without further ado, we now return you to MASH. And more importantly, I don't have a card. The GPU apocalypse may be coming to an end, but any GPU is still an expensive piece of hardware that I'm not prepared to shell out for. Now for kicks, I did try encoding just on VTR CPU to see how it would go. Uh, I got a whole eight frames per second, um, meaning that encoding an hour of footage would take about half a day. Uh, the RTX 3070 in my PC, on the other hand, can do the same task at over 100 FPS and finishes in half an hour. So this is clearly not a solution. Also, after about 10 minutes, it popped a breaker and then set the power supply on fire, uh, forcing me to throw it in the timeout sink for bad power supplies until it stopped crackling and popping. Funny thing about this, I actually have no idea what went wrong. I can't find anything damaged, no scorch marks, no idea where the smoke came from, but obviously can't use it again. So for now, I'll have to continue doing encodes on my desktop. Maybe I'll eventually try an old NVIDIA GPU if I can get one, but my real hope is that Intel will actually make it to market with the ARC A40 Pro. Uh, it's a card that's basically designed to solve exactly my problem. It'll have onboard H.264, 265, and AV1 encoding, and I think it might be able to run entirely from a PCIe slot with no additional power. If so, then it's a slam dunk. It'll solve my problem, and I can make this an automated transcoding box assuming Intel delivers usable Linux drivers, which is not very likely. For now though, that's the one thing this machine can't deliver on. And I have to admit, although I knew the encoding problem wasn't gonna be easily solved, it was a bummer since that's really the thing I wanted to automate the most. And unfortunately, it's not the only problem I've encountered through this whole process. It's been a bit of an undertaking, honestly. Most of the problems I've had admittedly did come down to very poor luck, like my power supply experience, which I think was probably just random chance and not actually the result of anything I did, but there have been other problems along the way. For one thing, before I could get started with any of this, I had to figure out exactly how I was going to hook it up to my PC. Like I said, these video files will saturate a gigabit connection, so for this to work, I needed something faster than a gigabit. The motherboard in my PC is pretty recent, so it came with a pair of 2.5 gigabit ethernet ports, but I've heard from some people that 2.5 gig E is kind of a weird standard that isn't really worth switching to. And whether that's true or not, it's moot because it's actually still not fast enough. True, it would handle playing one of these clips, but I often find myself playing two at once, like I'm doing right now, uh, layering B-roll over the top of A-roll. That requires streaming both files simultaneously. If one is 1100 megabits, then two will be 2200, and now we're pretty close to saturating even the 2.5 gig. If I stack up three simultaneous clips, like I'm doing now, I'll be looking at 3300 megabits, um, 3.2 gigabits for you metric folks, and that'll punch right past 2.5 gig e effortlessly. Now, is this situation likely? Well, it has happened at least once. Um, I've done a three clip stack up in an actual video, but it's admittedly not gonna be common. Still, I want the option, and I don't want to be running so close to the ceiling on my uplink that if, uh, for instance, I mouse over a file in the media library while Resolve is playing a two-clip stack up, the sudden additional bandwidth won't cause the app to hang as its buffers underrun. Or maybe I want to copy a file while I'm editing video and not have it become totally unusable. I want some headroom, not the bare minimum. 
Now, supposedly there is a five gigabit ethernet standard, which would solve this problem, but I get the same impression about being a sort of in-between option. I'd like something that's tried, true, tested, and has been around for ages, and that would be 10 gigabit ethernet. 10 gigabit ethernet has been around since 2002 in the enterprise and carrier world, but I didn't start hearing about consumer grade 10 gig NICs until just a couple years ago. Most people of course have very little use for that kind of speed, unless they're building some kind of absurd SSD based NAS in their home. But that's what I'm doing, so yeah, I'm gonna need some 10 gig E cards. Now I can go to Amazon and buy a card that uses standard CAT6 cable, but frankly I don't really trust that. I've never trusted twisted pair ethernet. I've had problems with it my entire life. And even the factory molded cables can fail internally or have a marginal crimp job and just cause problems. For 100 meg or even gigabit, twisted pair does okay, but I've heard that 10 gig over cat six is flaky and picky. And I just know that if I go with it, I'm gonna have insidious failures. They'll drop my transfer speeds back to one gig or worse until I recrimp or repunch or replace the cable and it'll happen right in the middle of a video project. I just know it will because it's happened already. Uh, the NIC on my awful little HP micro server randomly drops back to 100 megabits in the middle of the day even though nothing's touching the cables. Even swapping patch cords and wall outlets hasn't fixed it. And I've had other devices do it too, so I know it's not the machine. I just don't want to rely on CAT6 for something this critical. It's a garbage medium. Now, most of the 10 gig stuff I've encountered in my career has been fiber based, and that probably is the front runner here. I don't love the idea of using fiber just because I don't have much experience with it. Um, it's weird. And you can't just like casually recrimp a fiber cable. So I'd have to keep a bunch of spares in stock and I don't know how to treat it right. You know, I don't have a feel for what kind of punishment it can take. You know, can I, can I pull it? Can I, ah, but, Still, I get the impression that it's really not that hard to work with and the cables aren't expensive or rare. Uh, now that suggests that I'd want a fiber optic 10 gig network card, right? But as far as I can tell, those don't really exist anymore. Um, they certainly used to. Uh, this here is a one gigabit fiber NIC. Uh, it's got, you know, a weird plug on the back, but it otherwise works pretty much like any other. You take your cable, plug it in, click, and there you go. The link lights come on and you're ready to network or, well, you would be if this was a NIC and not a fiber channel card. I hadn't read the label on the end. I don't know much about fiber channel, but I know this card is meant only for connection to a storage array, not to a conventional network. Still, it uses the same cables, and if it was a NIC, it would pretty much look identical. We now return you to Higurashi When They Cry. These were around for ages, but it seems like they've been sort of phased out in favor of another kind of card that's been around for ages. This is actually a 10 gig NIC, but instead of a jack for fiber or even twisted pair, it has these two rectangular slots. These are called SFP ports. Uh, they're about two, three inches deep, and they accept one of these, an SFP module. Some people just abbreviate it to SFP. I'm one of them. Um, the idea here is that instead of the card supporting one specific kind of network cable or uh, medium, it can be adapted to whatever sort you have. Um, this SFP, for instance, is a fiber transceiver. It's a little uh, die cast block that contains a microprocessor, some laser diodes, and optics required to produce a fiber optic ethernet signal. So you take this, you plug it into your SFP NIC, and it doesn't fit because it's upside down, and now you have a fiber NIC. Um, you can just take your fiber cable, plug it in right there, and now we're networked. Now, why do all this? Well, at the point where you're working with ethernet speeds like this, you're probably a enterprise or a carrier and you're not gonna be sure what the future holds at all times. Um, the thing on the other end of this fiber connection could someday be replaced with something that only does copper or some exotic new form of ethernet. Ethernet over water. Yeah, I'd like to get a copy of that for myself on water. Yeah. Or vice versa. Maybe this has a twisted pair interface, you're using CAT6, um, but eventually you move the two pieces of equipment too far apart. CAT6 can't reach anymore, so you'd really like to change to fiber. If that happens, you can just unplug the existing SFP, replace it with a twisted pair SFP, like this guy right here. And just like that, your card has changed mediums entirely. So I was happy when RePC, where I got this machine, had an SFP NIC in stock so I could have that flexibility. Uh, but my plan, since I don't want to use CAT6, was to get myself a fiber SFP. But then the junk store threw me a curveball. 
want you to think about something for me. These SFP transceivers, they're fiber, RJ45, whatever, but they're plugging into contacts way down inside this slot. There's like eight or 10 pins in there. Well, those are pretty much a network jack already, right? So can't you just plug those together, machine to machine, just skip the transceivers entirely? It's like suggesting that you could put your graphics card 15 feet across the room and just run a long PCIe cable over to it. No! Three meters of PCI Express extension. Oh, right. That does work. I mean, it's still absurd though, because PCIe just isn't intended for that. You don't know what's gonna go wrong, but consider this, um, my new NAS is not meant to plug into a network. Um, whether I use fiber or copper or whatever, I'm not plugging it into a switch. Um, the NIC on this Dell is gonna plug straight into the NIC on my PC. So it's kind of silly to bother with an actual network medium. What we're doing here is less networking and more like just plugging in a big fat SATA cable. Now, for exactly this kind of point-to-point -point connection, there is an incredibly simple solution. It's called a direct attach copper cable, and this is one. From what I've read, uh, this is literally exactly what I joked about. This thing has the wires from the SFP port, and they're brought out into a cable. That's it. There's twin ax or twin axial cable inside. It's sort of like a coax antenna cable, except it has uh, two wires instead of one, uh, but it's basically uh, heavily shielded and they just run uh, two pairs of wire, I guess, from one end to the other and connect the SFPs face to face, ass to ass, really. Apparently in some of these cables, uh, the SFP ends do contain like actual circuitry for signal amplification and cleanup, uh, but others are literally just copper wire in a jacket and nothing more. It's incredibly funny to me that you can just skip the middleman like this. Now. It's not quite a replacement for, you know, fiber or cat six. Um, you wouldn't use this for long runs. Direct attach is basically meant for these weird ad hoc situations like uh, stacking network switches where you need a lot of bandwidth between two devices, but they're like four inches apart in one rack. It's kind of a pain to use fiber cable and chew up some extra transceivers uh, just for such a short run. These cables are perfect for that kind of application. And in fact, they don't come any longer than about 20 meters. That's about 65 feet for you Imperial folks. Um, because the signal just isn't intended for long runs like that. It's not even really supposed to go further than, you know, three inches. It's like a board level interconnect that they've put into a cable. Come on, this, this whole thing is just perverse to begin with. Uh, of course, there are probably an awful lot of people watching this and thinking, wow, 60 feet, I could, I could wire my whole apartment with cables that long. And honestly, I don't have a reason that you couldn't. You probably should. For my application, I really was thinking of going with fiber, but when I was handed this 20 foot direct attached cable with a $20 price tag, with it in my hands, I realized it feels like a much safer option. I mean, the cable itself just feels super robust. Uh, and these connectors, these are like die cast magnesium or something, and they're actually clamped onto the cable with screws. Um, and uh, from diagrams I've seen online, I don't want to take these apart and find out and maybe damage them, but uh, supposedly there's like a big hunk of plastic molded in here. So this is like the toughest strain relief I've ever seen. You're not going to break any wires or pull the cable out of this connector. And you know, it's a lot less floppy than fiber, which kind of feels like wiring up your computers with wet spaghetti. So I really felt like this was my best bet for long-term reliability. And it's not, you know, weird or hard to use or anything uh, other than the very long plug bodies, which sort of feel like jacking someone into the matrix. It's exactly the same as a normal ethernet cable. You plug it in, the link lights come on, and that's it. So I think these are probably a good solution if you want to do short range 10 gig. And it also means I don't have to spend an extra 20 bucks a piece on transceivers, uh, which was nice. And I also didn't even have to buy any adapter for the R720 uh, because the model I got includes two 10 gig SFP ports right on the back. Now, not all R720s have these. If you're trying to buy one, you wanna be careful. Some just have four copper one gig ports back there and some might even have a different kind of SFP. I'm not sure if I understand this part of the manual correctly, but basically, if you're buying one of these, you need to check if it's got the right ports. Um, I just got lucky. Now my server closet is a uh, space underneath the stairs in my basement, and it's only about 10 feet away from my desktop PC. So I shoved the cable through a hole in the drywall and drug it over to the rack. That's that, cable managed. I just 
plug the cables in, set some IP addresses, start it up iPerf to test it out, and there you have it, 9.8 gigabits. It's as close to the full broadside as I could ever really expect. So all that stuff made me nervous ahead of time, but it didn't actually give me much trouble. I mean, um, the SFP NIC that I got at first, this one right here, uh, was dead as fried chicken. It's deader than any PCIe card I've ever seen. Uh, it didn't crash my machine or show up with an error in device manager or anything. It just acted like I hadn't plugged anything in at all, uh, which is a failure mode I've never actually encountered um, for something that has no visibly scorched parts on it. So that was weird, but I just replaced it with another card and everything's been fine ever since. The last issue I ran into, however, was kind of a doozy. It was a, a perfect example of what's called a, a confounding problem, where you have two uh, possibly very unlikely things occur simultaneously, and it makes diagnosing either one a lot harder than it has to be. The very first thing I did when I got this machine home is I took the two crucial BX500s uh, and stuffed them in here so I could find out if my whole hypothesis was practical, um, because, you see, I'd never had a chance to actually try editing video over a network, and I could not really fully accept that it would work. Virtually all the file sharing I've ever done, except for a little bit of tinkering with NFS, has been over SMB, aka SIFS, aka Samba, aka Windows Networking, and while I know Microsoft has made huge strides with the protocol, I still just have a hard time trusting the incredible speed of modern computing to actually deliver. To my head, knowing how sluggish Windows can be when you, say, try to log on to a machine or map a network drive, uh, the idea that I can not only pull a sustained three gigabits of traffic from a file share, but also jump around in files randomly when I'm dragging the playhead around in my editor without awful 10 second pauses all over the place, it just seems impossible to believe. Uh, despite having heard that people like Linus Tech Tips and other YouTubers had backing stores for their video editing like this, I don't really know the details of their setups. Maybe they have to do weird tuning things. Uh, maybe they forwent SMB and used NFS, or maybe something else I don't even know about. I just didn't know, so I was eager to see if it actually worked. Uh, but not having ever had a 10 gigabit Ethernet connection on anything before I started this project, there was nothing I could test with. So as soon as I got this system and my 10 gig NIC home, I wanted to find out as quickly as possible whether this was going to work at all before I put in any more effort. Unfortunately, things got pretty weird almost immediately. When I powered this machine up for the very first time, it printed an error about the PCIe link width on the RAID controller being only 4x when it should be 8x. I'd never seen an error like that in my life, but I still knew it was bad news. Um, that kind of error is pretty much guaranteed to be a hardware level problem. Still, I went ahead, plugged in some drives, and they all showed up just fine, so I decided to back burner that worry until I saw something actually fail to function as intended. Before I could do any testing, however, I had to perform an incantation that's well known to hobbyist server owners, the IT mode reflash. To make a long story short, uh, server drive controllers are only designed to operate in hardware RAID mode, which offers features that make sense in an enterprise environment, but really don't work very well outside of one. The very first thing almost every hobbyist does is to put the card in a pass-through mode that makes it behave like just a bunch of SATA ports. It disables all the hardware RAID and disk management features, and it's referred to by a few different names, including IT mode. To achieve this, you usually have to flash new firmware onto the card, uh, and on the Dell RAID controllers like this one, the process is unofficial. Very, very unofficial. It's incredibly unofficial. It does work, however, and uh, despite uh, the errors on startup that I was still getting, I was able to not only flash the card, but install an OS and boot from it with no trouble. Uh, I didn't get any strange errors after boot, nothing in the kernel log. Um, I verified with LSPCI that it really was only getting four lanes, but it seemed to work fine. So I set up Samba, I shared the crucial SSDs, I spent a while copying some footage over, and then I was ready to test. So I opened up a clip and it didn't work at all. It was like playing from an SD card. It struggled so badly that my media player was actually freezing up due to the, the network delays. Uh, so I started checking things. I, I checked the network, it was fine. I checked the kernel log, no errors. I looked for resource issues, all the usual stuff, but everything looked fine. The machine seemed healthy and this was a brand new install of the OS. So I started doing performance tests on the hard drives. I checked them with every tool I could find, DD, FIO, HDParm, etc., and everything came up with the same answer. 
The drives could only deliver about 100 megabytes per second. That's about 800 megabits. That's not enough to play my video files. And in fact, if I just copied a file to my desktop, I didn't even get that much speed. It was more like 75 megabytes per second. It varied all over the place. Now this made no sense to me. Um, I'd actually striped these drives together as an experiment, so it really should have performed even better than I expected. I took them out of the stripe, but nothing improved. Um, the speeds were just disastrously low. And while I knew that even four PCIe lanes should be much faster than what I needed, I had to consider the possibility that that message was hiding a larger problem. So I looked up the error and learned that it usually happens when the interface pins on the RAID card are dirty. A receipt should fix it. Now, the RAID card for these things is often one of these. It plugs into a custom port on the board that has a bunch of pins that are facing straight upwards. I can sort of imagine that this funky thing can collect some dust over time, um, although the machine itself was completely, absolutely spotless inside. It must have lived on filtered air, and it didn't look like anybody had ever disassembled it. Uh, in fact, uh, when I went to remove this card, the little plastic release levers on either side shattered as soon as I touched them. I don't know why that happened, um, but I found out that all the plastic in the machine is super fragile like that, and I have no idea why. At any rate, it sure didn't look like anyone had disturbed it. Um, reseating the card several times didn't help, uh, so I looked further. Um, I found one Forumite who said they actually had to take their CPU out and clean the LGA. PCIe lanes actually can go straight back to your CPU, so this makes sense, um, but I tried it and no dice. Now, shortly after that, I started the machine up and got a, a PCIe link training error, uh, which I'd never seen before, and the machine just halted. Uh, on the next boot, it worked fine, but after that, when I would reboot the machine, I intermittently got only X4, or I got training errors, or in one case, it warned me that the card should be running at eight lanes, but was only running at zero. So I knew I had to replace it. So I went back to RePC. I found another Dell RAID controller for next to nothing, um, brought it home, plugged it in, no errors, went through the whole reflashing process. Everything worked, but of course it had a new problem. The goddamn cables aren't compatible. This is the card I bought to replace this one that came with the machine. Now these are both Dell Perk H710s, um, but this one is custom for these systems and this one can go in any machine. Probably for that reason, they use different connectors. The full size model uses a pair of what are called mini SAS plugs. Uh, and these connect up to the back plane, the board in the machine uh, where all the hard drives plug in. Now you won't find these SAS connectors in the consumer world, but in servers, they're very common for backplane connections. Uh, normally, each one of these plugs can connect up to four SAS or SATA hard drives. We'll talk about SAS shortly. Uh, you can even get cables like this one here. Uh, you actually plug this in to one of these ports and then it breaks out to four individual SATA plugs. So uh, if you put this in your machine, uh, you could plug in two of these cables and then hook up eight drives uh, into a single PCIe slot, uh, which is very convenient. The trouble here is that the cable that came with the machine doesn't have these plugs on it. Uh, instead, it has the correct ones on one end, this is mini SAS, but then on this end, it has a completely different thing called Slim SAS 8L. This is supposed to put eight drives into one plug uh, instead of four in two. Now, obviously I can't plug this in there and it seems like the solution is just buy another cable, but this is one of the few cables you'll ever find in a server and they're very specific. Space inside servers is very tight. Um, like I said, they're not designed to be packed with flying leads uh, like a desktop PC. Um, thanks to their high performance cooling solutions and cramped interiors, there's really nowhere to put cables. See, there's this thing called the fan tray, which spans the entire machine. This is completely solid, top to bottom, left to right. That's on purpose because it's actually supposed to basically pressurize the inside of the server. So there's no way to get a cable over, under, or around this, except through a very narrow channel on one end. That's where the SAS cable for the backplane is supposed to go through and there's no room for anything else. So even if I had found some generic cables at the RePC, I wouldn't be able to just plug it in from backplane to card as the crow flies. There's nowhere to put it. So to fix this, I would need a pair of cables that would fit in that same channel that were cut to exactly the right length because any excess would be almost impossible to stuff anywhere. 
and could interfere with the cooling solution for the machine. I was surprised then to discover that exactly this product exists. Uh, only for a minute though. Um, like I said, people have been home gaming with these servers for years, so it makes sense that there would be a third party accessory market. And on Amazon for about 20 bucks, you can buy a pair of cables that are almost certainly custom made for this specific machine or a handful of similar models. Again, I put a non-affiliate link in the description in case you're trying to find these yourself. So I got two of these. And the crucial thing is that they have a right angle mini SAS plug on one end, but only one. Because the sockets on the back plane face upwards. A cable with straight ends can't fit there. The lid would clunk right into it when you go to close it. So right angle is a must there, but if it was right angle on both ends, then you wouldn't be able to plug two of these into the card. So these cables are perfect, or at least they're as close as you're going to get. If you look at the original cable, it's made up of two cables of different lengths, so they're exactly the right distance. Well, since these are identical, that means that one of them is going to have to plug in a lot shorter than the other, and you're going to end up with excess that you have to stuff somewhere. But fortunately, it's just a couple inches, and it's a pain, but it's manageable. The bigger problem I found is that the plugs, while they are a right angle, are actually a bit too big. Big. There isn't a millimeter to spare inside this machine, and anything that sticks up past the fan tray will prevent the case from closing. Um, I almost uh, snapped the plug off the board because I didn't realize uh, that it was running into the back of this thing. The tops of these plugs sit just the tiniest bit proud of the fan tray, just enough that the lid absolutely will not close. So to fix it, I had to actually file down the back of the plug. The plastic is too hard to cut with a knife, so I had to just grind it down bit by bit until it fit. And by the time it did, I was actually starting to expose the end of a printed circuit board through the plastic. So I'm glad I didn't have to go any further or I might have destroyed the cable. Now, once I finished modifying one cable to fit, I was really dreading doing it to the other. Uh, but due to a stroke of luck, it turned out I didn't need to, uh, or at least not yet. Uh, see, while I was investigating the speed issues, I found a guy on a forum who had similar problems to mine, and he reported that unplugging one of these cables fixed them. Nobody had any explanation for why, but the whole thing threw me for a loop. Because wouldn't that kill half the drives if one of the cables was unplugged? Well, then I realized it never made any sense to begin with. Um, this back plane has two SAS plugs on it, and each plug can handle four drives, but the back plane has 12. So how did this ever work? Well, my guess is that the huge heat sink on the back plane is hiding a chip that talks to all the drives directly and then packages them up into LUNs. I, I mentioned those in the SCSI CD-ROM tower video I did a while back. Uh, they're a SCSI protocol feature that lets you put multiple logical devices on a single physical interface. Um, SAS is serial attached SCSI. It is the latest form, as far as I'm aware of, of the SCSI standard. Um, it is not SATA. It is a completely different protocol, although it uses an identical connector. Uh, and SAS is what machines like this are actually supposed to use. If you're buying enterprise drives, or at least this used to be the case, uh, SAS is what they would have. But uh, for some reason, all SAS controllers apparently support SATA. I mean, I'm sure it's just for convenience. You know, the SAS controller detects a SATA drive and it switches protocols. But if that's the case, then how is it doing the LUN trickery, if that's what it's doing? I don't know. And at any rate, nobody seems to know why there's two cables. If you unplug one, everything still works perfectly. Maybe if I start putting more drives in here, striping them together, and trying to pull more bandwidth off this thing, I'll eventually hit some kind of cap at like 30 gigabits or something like that, and I'll have to install the other cable to get the remaining bandwidth of the back plane. Or maybe this is just for redundancy. Who knows? But I'm not going to bother with it right now. I got one installed, got the lid on, buttoned it all up, and everything just worked fine, so I'm not gonna worry about it. Except, of course, that after doing all this, replacing the controller, getting rid of the PCIe errors, modifying the cable, and getting everything to start up with no complaints, I was still getting these atrocious speeds. And I beat my head against it for a whole day. Uh, eventually, I got fed up. I knew I needed to test the drives in another machine. I'd known this all along, of course, but I just didn't have anything handy. Um, nothing in my house had a spare SATA port available. I didn't even have any cables on hand. So I was avoiding it and avoiding it, but I knew I needed to do it. 
So I unplugged the DVD burner from my PC, plugged in one of the SSDs, ran Crystal Disk Mark, and wouldn't you know it, it got about 100 megabytes per second. Tops on the easiest test. The other ones were far, far worse. It turns out this thing absolutely sucks. The Crucial BX500 is rated for 500 megabytes a second of transfer per the spec sheet. So it should perform just fine for my needs, but instead it performs worse than some of my spinning disks. So I knew something was up. I went back to the web. I looked up an actual review instead of the specs. And it turns out the number that I'd read on the specs was bullshit. The BX500 apparently is a thing I hadn't heard of called a DRAMless SSD, essentially a drive with no cache. This is technically capable of 500 megabytes per second of transfer for like one second, and then it drops down to speeds that make a platter drive look fast. Look, I admit this happened because I'm privileged. I had not realized drives this bad existed anymore. I have this bad habit of never buying anything below top of the line, even if I can't actually afford it, I'll just buy nothing. As a result, all my SSDs ever have been Samsung Evos. I knew that drives with pitiful performance, like the EMMC ones that were around back in the late 2000s existed, but I thought surely by now we'd given up on trash like that, and that virtually everything on the market was tolerably quick, at least a couple hundred megs per second. Serves me for being optimistic, I guess. Once I realized the drives were the problem, I uh, scrounged up an SSD that I knew was performant, an ancient Intel SSD 320. Uh, despite being 11 years older than the Crucial, it ran circles around it. In fact, I was able to move over my raw footage and test my network-based video editing hypothesis right there on the spot, and it worked perfectly. I was shocked at how fast it was. Um, I could not tell the difference between using Resolve on a local drive and with files on a network share. And I didn't have to do any kind of tuning, no wacky configuration or network block size nonsense, none of that. Everything on bone stock defaults just worked. So the idea was valid and there was nothing wrong with the machine, at least nothing I discovered until my video encoding test made the smoke come out of the power supply. The only real problem I had, other than the dead RAID controller, which was obvious, was solved by going out, picking up another pair of Samsung Evos, and now everything seems to be ready to go. So that pretty much brings us up to date. Um, I know this video probably wasn't as exciting as my usual stuff tries to be, but it's what's been going on with me lately, and I thought some of you might have a use for the info or at least find the process interesting. I still have further improvements to make, but as it stands, this machine is already a substantial improvement over the utterly ad hoc solution I was using before, uh, or at least I, I hope it is. I haven't actually had a chance to use it yet. Uh, this is the first video I've shot in weeks, so when I finish here, I'm gonna go home, hook the whole machine back up, um, copy my data over and test for the first time to see if it can really truly do what Nintendo don't. So if you see this video and it doesn't have any editing bay webcam inserts, you'll know I pulled it off. Wow, what a jerk. Anyway, here I am in the editing bay where this is all working more or less perfectly. I edited the entire video off the server, never had any speed issues, and although I did have a couple pretty wacky problems along the way, they were pretty much all things I predicted. Uh, they include Windows deciding that none of my shares could be reconnected due to multiple connections to the server, even though none existed. That's pretty much universal Windows networking. It just does it every four hours to a day. You could just about set your watch by it. Uh, there was also a problem where it routed the traffic over my slow NIC instead of my fast one, despite my share being made to the specific IP of the 10 gig connection. And I also discovered that Resolve is apparently incapable of rendering to a network share. No idea why, it just says it doesn't have permissions. Finally, there were a couple occasions where the machine went to standby, and when it came back, Resolve read gibberish from all my files until I closed and reopened it. But I didn't lose any work to any of these problems, and like I said, they're all par for the course with Windows networking. I'd say so far, they're pretty reasonable trades for all the benefits I'm getting. So overall, I'm feeling satisfied, and I think this was all a good idea. So now let's return to the conclusion of Heidi. And I know that was long-winded, so uh, if you made it here, thanks for sticking around. I know I haven't had a video out in several weeks and maybe this wasn't the one you were hoping I'd come back with. Uh, but a thing about living in Seattle is that pretty much nobody has air conditioning, especially not cheap rented offices. This place has been intolerably hot for the last two months. My hands are sticking to the table. 
Uh, and that's led to an impromptu summer vacation, hopefully coming to an end soon as the weather changes. Fingers crossed. But anyway, if you enjoyed this video and somehow aren't already a subscriber, wow, I'm shocked you hung around at all, maybe consider subscribing now if you liked it that much. And remember to turn on notifications if you want to find out when I upload new videos. If you really enjoyed this, however, consider supporting me on Patreon like these people here are doing. I couldn't afford this server, the drives, the camera, or the studio to use it all in without the help of viewers like you, and particularly viewers like them. So consider becoming one yourself. I am incredibly grateful to everyone who's backing me on there. Thank you all so much, and everyone else, thanks for watching.